All right. Well, we, um, we are in a series uh, we've called Created for Connection. Um, and so the main point of today's message is uh, to be the friend to others that you hope others will be to you. Right? To be the friend to others that you hope others will be to you. Um, if you're not a note taker, let me encourage you to be a note taker. Apparently, we retain stuff so much more um, when we not just listen, but we also then write it. And then if you really want to retain it, say it to someone else later. Like, repeat it. Um, it'll help retention rates. Um, so anyways, uh, if you recall, uh, as God was creating the world in Genesis 1, so if you have your Bibles, we're going to jump around a little bit again. Um, if you're new to Austin Life, typically... I would say 73% of the time, um, we're just working through a book of the Bible, um, right? And, and that's my preferred way to do it. Um, but, but on occasion, we will take some topics uh, that are either relevant to where we are as a culture or just that we've sensed God is pressing on us um, and, and spend time on specific topics. Um, I don't love topical because it kind of, you kind of go all over and you can, it's easier to just like build something. It's easier to, this is, Great example. It's easier to do eisegesis, which is reading into the text what you want it to say, versus exegesis, which is taking the truth out of the text and say, this is what God says, so be it, versus here's the point I want to make. Let me read into the Bible and find the points that I think will support that, right? So topical makes that a little bit easier to do, uh, and so I prefer just to go through a book of the Bible because it's like, well, it's here. I can't avoid this. Um, I would have not ever preached on this verse except... (laughs) It's obvious. It's right here. So um, we're doing a series on connection. And if you recall, in Genesis 1, as God's creating the world, he would create something, you know, the, the sky and, and the earth, and, and he would, at some point during creation, look at what he made, and, and we see these same three words, it is good, right? So he would create the heavens and the earth, it is good. He would create the sun and the moon, it is good. The stars, the, the, the animals. I'm always curious what animals he began with, right? Because there's some animals I would look at and be like, huh, really? You know, like the mosquito? Um, is that good? Uh, surely that's like a, a permutation of the, of the fall of sin, because I don't understand that one. But right, it is good. He would create something, and, and those three words would follow. It is good until God created Adam, until he created humanity, and the first time in all of God's good creation, he said these words in Genesis 2, 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Something wasn't good. It's not that God had made a mistake or or sinned. It's that it wasn't complete yet. And so something wasn't good. What was not good that Adam was alone? If we look back to Genesis 1:26, verse 26, it says that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, right? God said, let us make man in our image, Humanity, Adam, was created with the primary purpose of being an, a reflection of who God is, of reflecting the image of God, that, that if we were able to watch Adam according to God's design, we should be able to see more of who God is and what he's like and what his character is like if Adam is act, actually reflecting the image of God. Well, what do we know of, of God? We know that God is triune, three united in selfless love, so deeply, so intimately connected that he is one God. The Father loving the Son through the Spirit, the Son loving the Father through the Spirit, and the three unique persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, Spirit, so intimately connected that there's one God, one God in three persons. And so, in sum, Adam was, ref- was created to reflect that God, that communal God, loving one another within himself. And so, it would be impossible, impossible for Adam to fulfill his designed purpose if he was alone. How would he love God and love others if there was no other for him to love? So when you look at that picture, go back to that one real fast, Steph, you see that it's, it's, 
There's no one for Adam to love. He, it's impossible for him to reflect a triune God when, it's, when there's no one for him to love other than God. And so God created a helper fit for him. God created Eve so that together, Adam and Eve could both love God and love one another and be a reflection of the triune communal God. The creation of Eve was not first and foremost for marriage. Marriage came as a part of it, but the creation of Eve was for community, for connection, that Adam would be able to connect with someone that was similar to him, yet different, and thus reflect God. The father is not the son, but is connected to the son so intimately that they're one. And in John 17, Jesus would say that his desire is for us to love each other, to be so connected with one another that we reflect the intimacy of the perfect God. That we would be connected so closely with one another just as Jesus the Son is connected with the Father. So that when people see our connection, they see more of the, the, the character of God. They see more of who God is. Selflessly preferring, selflessly serving, selflessly loving the other. And so it was not good for Adam to be alone because it would be impossible for him to fulfill the purpose that God created him to have, which was to be a reflection of a communal God. We are created for connection. It is for our own good. We will never be, listen to me, you will never be all that God has created you to be without deep, lasting connection with others that reflects the connection we see between Father, Son, and Spirit. You will never be all that God has created you to be without that deep, lasting, and secure connection. People in your life that, that say, hey, I'm in this with you, and together, me and you are running this race for the long haul to help each other become more like Jesus. It is how God has designed us from the very beginning. And, and we all know this. We all want those relationships, right? We all want our, our people. You know what I'm saying? Like those, those people that you're not on with, those people that you can just be authentically yourself and they, they see you and they know everything about you and yet they still, they still want to be your friend, right? Those people that when you go over, you don't have to ask permission to go in their fridge, right? To grab food. You know what I'm talking about? Like most places, you're like, hey, is this okay? And, 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 but we want those people where you walk in, it's like, I'm, gonna, I'm not even going to ask. Like it's, it's expected. We just, I'm going to sit down on the couch. I'm going to grab the remote, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change. I'm going to put on what I, Right? We all want those relationships, those people you'll vacation with, right? Like, that's when things get dicey. You travel with somebody, whew, man, but we all want those relationships. We all want that connection. We all want someone that, man, they may be mad at us, but if somebody else bad mouths us, they'll fight them, right? Like, they'll, they'll anybody ever seen the movie, The Town? God, so, such a good movie, right? Where, where, uh, Ben Affleck walks in and Jeremy Renner's sitting there and he's like, hey, I need your help with something and you can't ever ask me about it again and we're going to hurt some people. And Jeremy Renner goes, whose car are we taking? Right, like those are the kind of, like we don't want to hurt people, but those are the kind of friends you, those are the kind of people you want, right? People that will have your back, that will bail you out of jail if you end up in jail sometime for whatever reason. I mean, that's not going to happen, right? But you know, like those are the kind of relationships that it's wired in our soul. We want those people. We want those relationships, and yet three out of five of us today would say that we routinely feel lonely, that it is a, it is a normal occurrence within every given day that at some point we feel lonely. And if right now you're like, that's ah, not me, my guess is at some point in your life you have felt that. You, you know what it's like to walk into a room and, and for there to be a lot going on and to feel like nobody sees you, right? You know what it's like to, to just want to hang out with, with friends and nobody calls you, or we all know that and it, we hate it. Like we, we hate it because that's not how we're designed, right? Loneliness is as contrary to human nature as, as not breathing, it's, it's, it's not how we're designed to function. 
We're not designed to be isolated, lonely people, and we hate it. But the good news is that's not God's design for us, and he hasn't left us alone. And he's given us people with which we can build these friendships with. So what do we do? Right, if that is how we are created, we are created for deep connection. And if you're like, oh, you know, what does that mean? Deep connection at the level that Jesus has connected to the Father. So deeply that there's one God, right? That, that's the level that our souls are created for, right? So how do we build into that? Now, what Jared talked about last week is step one, friendship with Jesus, that we would first be connected to Jesus, that our spirit, our soul would be connected to Jesus by his spirit and by his soul. Now, can you have great friendships outside of Jesus? Yes, absolutely, 100%. But I don't believe they will be all that we are created for. I think we'll continually lack something and we'll look to someone else to give us what they ultimately cannot give us. Step one to having real friendships with others is first a friendship in Jesus. Let me tell you why. Luke 9, 25. Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? If you have all the friends on the planet, if you are the most liked and likable person, if you've got your people, your, you've got your boys, you've got your girls, you've got, you got your crew, right? But in the end, you don't know Jesus. We've... we've We've gained perhaps some temporary friendships, but we've lost an eternity of connection. What's the point of having earthly friendships that this is giving a heavy benefit of the doubt, right? That, that will last us perhaps a lifetime and be the best friendship ever, which we already know doesn't exist, right? What's the point of that if we forfeit our soul? We're created first and foremost to be connected with God, to walk with him, to have a friendship with Jesus, so even if we have those great friendships, but we don't have a friendship with Jesus, we're missing step one of our created purpose. Friendship with Jesus then also gives us a friendship that will fully satisfy us and not let us down. Psalm 90 verse 14 says, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Right, if, if we don't have, Jesus gives us the friendship of someone who will never leave us and never fail us and never treat us poorly, right? If I don't have that friendship with Jesus, I'm going to look for that connection from you, and that's too much weight to put on your shoulders. You literally cannot carry the weight of the, the friendship my soul desires. It'll be crushing, and, and, and you'll do the same to me. Right, we'll crush each other. If I look to Stephanie to be the relational connection that my soul needs at its deepest level, uh, it, it's too much. She can't live up to that weight. I, I can't live up to that weight. But if we have our fill in Jesus, th then we don't have to put all that weight on someone else. Right? It lightens their load to be our friend. It lightens our load to be their friend when we're actually being satisfied relationally in our relationship and connection with Jesus. And, and the third reason why friendship with Jesus is step one is because it gives us his spirit to actually live out obedience to being a true friend. How many of you would say that like real connection, friendship, real relationship is easy? Should we do the thumb up, thumb down thing again? Is that, right? We know. We know. We know. Relationships are messy. Right? Especially when you, when you move past the veneer of superficiality. It gets ugly, right? They're messy. And yet we're called to be a friend to others that Jesus is with the Father. How are we going to do that? It's only by the help of his spirit of friendship in us that empowers us and actually gives us the ability to be that friend to others. Friendship with Jesus is step one to having the connections with others that our souls long for. We've got to start with Jesus. Then what? I've got four principles from Scripture today that I believe will begin moving us in the right direction. The rest of this series um, addresses some of the one another commands, right? So next week is love one another and the various ways that that plays out. Another week, I don't remember the order, is serve one another. 
honor one another, welcome one another, right? So, so we'll build into uh, more specifics of what that looks like. But these are just some general principles that I believe Scripture teaches us for how we can begin to build those friendships. First one is the main point of this sermon. Be the friend to others that you hope others will be to you. Two, choose wisely who you pursue in the deepest levels of connection. Three, devote and endure in time with them. Four, be honest and vulnerable in the time that you spend. So one, be the friend you want others to be to you. Matthew 7, verse 12. All right, we're, we're going to read one of the most quoted, yet maybe not attributed to Jesus, verses in the Bible. We know it in preschool as the golden rule. Matthew 7, verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. In building friendships with others, our focus cannot be on what others will do to build a friendship with us, because ultimately we cannot control that. But what you and I can control, what you and I are responsible for, is our own actions. How we treat others, how we pursue friendship with others, what, what we do. And so the, the principle that Jesus gives us is, hey, quit, quit expecting others to do for you what you won't do for them. You want someone to be a great friend to you, first be a great friend to them. Be the friend to others that you hope others will be to you. Don't wait around for, for them to do it. Step up and initiate. Take responsibility. Take ownership. So often, right, we want everybody else to go first. We want everybody else to initiate. We want everybody else to come to us and say hello. We want everybody else to insert themselves into our lives. This week, we were at uh, Macy's, uh, so she was cheering at a soccer game, and uh, we saw one of Miles' cl uh, former classmates. Miles is in third grade. He's nine. He's my son. Um, so we saw a former classmate of his who uh, he used to have a crush on, and um, they passed each other, and they didn't even look at each other or acknowledge each other, right? Like, okay, fair. I, I get that. Um, but I was like, hey, why didn't you say hi? And he was like, I was only going to say hi if she said hi first. And I was like, no. Right? Come on. We all do that. Why? Because going first assumes the risk. If I put myself out, I'm the one at risk for rejection, right? I'm the one at risk for you not following up. I'm the one at risk for you saying no. I'm the one at risk for you scoffing at me saying hi to you. And so we don't want that danger. We don't want that risk. So we hope someone else will go first. Someone else will take the risk. Someone else will, will risk rejection. But Jesus says, well, no, you, you take the risk. Be to others what you hope they'll be to you. If you want them to say hi to you, then you say hi to them. If you want them to be your friend, then you be their friend. And let's be honest, how many of us would love for others to take the ownership and the risk? Would love for others to go first in building the friendship? Right? Okay. What did Jesus tell us? Do to others what you would love for them to do to you. If you want others to go first, you got to take it up with Jesus here. He tells you to go first. He tells you to initiate and pursue. Everyone wants that. We are to take that risk on ourselves. So if the friend you hope is someone that will call or text you with no agenda just to talk, if that's what you want from a friend, you better start calling and texting people just to talk. If what you want in a great friend is someone that will invite you on a weekend getaway, Better start inviting people on a weekend getaway. If, if what you want in a friend is someone who will text you on Friday afternoon and be like, hey, let's go to dinner tonight, I'm picking you up, then what does Jesus say? Be the person that says, hey, I'm picking you up for dinner, let's, let's go to dinner. If the friend that you want is someone who will actually care about your spiritual well-being and will challenge you and hold you accountable, then be the friend of someone else, care about their spiritual well-being and hold them accountable and walk with them. If you want someone as a friend who will, will pray for you and follow up about it, then be that person for them. If you want someone as a friend who will take interest in you and learn what you like and then get this, 
actually do what pleases you, then be a friend that takes interest in another, learns what they like, then actually does what pleases them. Right? If, if we're not growing in these friendships, like there's a number of reasons, but at the end of the day, the bottom line is it starts with us. Will we take ownership to be the friend to others that we hope others will be to us? I can't control what any of you do. I can't control what I do. I can't control how I treat you, how I invest in the friendship. Don't let the fear of rejection or disappointment stop you. I promise you in this room are numerous people that are longing for those connections and hoping somebody will go first. If we all take this seriously, I, I promise you, things will look different six months from now for you. Be the friend to others that you hope others will be to you. Next, choose wisely who you invest your time with. Proverbs 13, 20 says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. We all know this. Look at the people you spend the most time with. And I guarantee you, you'll say similar things, you like similar things, you go to similar places, have similar hobbies. Right? Who, who we spend the most time with is what we begin to look like. Biologically, we have mirroring neurons. That's a tough word for me to say. Ours are tough. Mirroring Jackie, you were here last time I talked about mirror neurons. You're here again. Jackie's uh, get, becoming a doctor um, in Fort Worth. She's just having to visit today, and apparently I talk about mirroring neurons when you're here, Jackie. We have biologically mirroring neurons which reinforce our body to, to imitate people. When we do what other people are doing, there's something in our brain that fires off and tells us that was a good thing. It's how we're made to mirror and imitate one another, right? Which I, I find it interesting that it, we just realized this within the last decade or so, and yet pretty sure that's what God said in Genesis 1, right? That we're made to mirror him, you know, so maybe we can find our roots in all things back in God, but um, that's for another discussion, right? We're created to mirror people. Most of the good decisions I've made in my life, right, my, my spiritual disciplines or cooking a steak medium rare, right, came because other people were doing that and showing me a different way, right? It, it wasn't because I, on my own, was like, how do I cook a steak? What's the best way? No, I was around people. Like, most of my good decisions have other people connected to it, right? Most of my bad decisions, underage drinking, vandalism, right, poor spiritual disciplines, guess what? Also has people around me that that's what they're doing, right? We have to choose wisely who we are investing the bulk of our time with because that is biologically what we will mirror. It's, it's who we will imitate. It doesn't mean we don't have friends that, that aren't pointing us towards Christ, but they, they can't be getting the bulk of our time and influence, Right? Jesus spent time with, with those that didn't love God, but it wasn't the bulk of his time. It wasn't the deepest of his influencers. We've got to choose wisely who we are investing um, most of our time with. For some of you, here's the thing. Right now, you know exactly the people in your life that are influencing you away from becoming like Jesus. I don't even, Done, enough said. You know, you know who it is. And the application for you is they will continue to influence you away from Jesus. It doesn't mean we just cut them off cold turkey, but it does mean we start pulling back and putting more of our time and influence with people that will move us towards Christ. Some of us, as we're building friendships, we need to choose wisely who we're giving the, the greatest time to and investing our lives with. Right? The... The one who walks with the wise becomes wise, but a companion of fools suffers harm. We've seen it enough in our life. We've got to decide, are we going to start investing in people that make us become who we're created to be or investing in people that continue to hold us down and pull us down? Number three, you've got to devote and endure in time with people. 
If we are going to be the friends that we want to be, and if we're going to have the friendships that we want to have, it will require that we devote and commit intentional time with these people. And as best as we can possibly control it, that we endure in time with these people. Deep, secure, lasting friendships, friendships that you trust, that when they know everything, they're not going anywhere, and they're not going and sharing and bad-mouthing, that they got your back, that takes time. And that takes repeated trust. And we live in a culture that is wildly individualistic and self, um, self-centered and self-focused and has taught us to always chase something greener, which is a complete myth, and we don't give people the time it takes to actually build those relationships and those friendships. It takes time. When Jesus invited his disciples, what did he say? Hey, come, come with me. They left homes. They left families. They left jobs. They, they devoted their lives to being with Jesus. And then we look in Acts 2, in that, the first church, Following Jesus' lead, in Acts 2, verse 42, when it describes how they lived, it said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and what? Fellowship, friendship, connection, and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were, what's that word? together and had all things in common they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need and day by day attending the temple together there we go come on with it attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes they received their food with glad and generous hearts praising god and having favor with all the people and the lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved Right, the, the first church that was following the lead of Jesus lived life, what's the word, Max? Together. They devoted their lives together. It wasn't a, I mean, if I have time for this, I'll fit it in. It was, I will devote myself together with these people, and if I have time for these other things, I'll fit it in. As, as, as Christians, as American Christians in particular, we, we treat our faith like like a gym club or our favorite restaurant or, or like, I mean, here's my life and I'm doing my thing and I'll fit these things in as I like it. Rather than I am a Christian, I'll fit these things in if I like it. Right? As a Christian, our life is to revolve around being like Jesus and following him, not I'll add that in wherever I can and however it fits best. And so they devoted themselves together to spending time with one another. Studies apparently say that it takes 200 hours of face time with someone to to move to that next level of friendship. 200 hours. Let me tell you how you're not going to build that connection. Once a week on Sundays. That's going to take half a decade. Right? It's not going to happen. In that time, I promise you, you will find connection somewhere else and move on. How many hours do we spend at work with coworkers compared to the the church? The odds are not in our favor to build deep relationships here just in the way life is structured. We have to be intentional to devote time with one another or the connections will form somewhere else because that's how we're made. We have to devote time together. That's why I encourage you If you're looking to build friendships here, there's no reason you shouldn't sign up for the retreat. It's in November, so you got some time. There's no reason that you shouldn't come to the the pickleball hangs. There's no reason that you shouldn't be in a community group, that you shouldn't be going to lunch together, because it takes time. It takes a lot of time. And that's true wherever we are. It's just up to us how we use that time. It takes time spent together. In addition, I want to encourage you to commit to enduring in time with friends. All right, we've been trained by culture to chase whatever the next opportunity is, whatever promotion or pay raise, whatever cool experience. And what, what if we're, we're sacrificing what matters most, which is deep connection spent with someone over the long haul? 
Maybe we're gaining a cool Instagram story or, or a better pay raise, but we're continually lonely because we're not giving the time long enough with people to build those deep relationships. I'm intrigued by the Benedictine monks who take a vow of stability. They commit to staying in one monastery. Only God has the right to move them on. One monk wrote this. We vow to remain we vow to remain all our life with our local community. We live together, pray together, work together, relax together. We give up the temptation to move from place to place in search of an ideal situation. Come on. Ultimately, there is no escape from oneself, and the idea that things would be better someplace else is usually an illusion. And when interpersonal conflicts arise, we have a great incentive to work things out and restore peace. This means learning the practices of love, acknowledging one's own offensive behavior, giving up one's preferences, forgiving. Becoming like Jesus necessitates deep, lasting connection, and that takes time. It takes enduring. This life, the scripture says this, you, you're familiar, is fleeting. It's, it's a mist in the air, the Bible says. And we make our decisions for this mist, not for eternity. What if what's best for us is not a pay raise or is not upgrading houses and changing neighborhoods? What if what's best for us is staying put and building deep, long, lasting relationships that will actually help us become more like Jesus, help us survive the, the tumultuous points of life that inevitably will come. C.S. Lewis has this great quote. He said, the friendship is the greatest of worldly goods. Certainly to me, it is the chief happiness of life. If I had to give a piece of advice to a young man about a place to live, I think I should say, sacrifice almost everything to live where you can be near your friends. I know I'm very fortunate in that respect. What if our decision making was, one, what does God tell me to do? Do I take this promotion? Let's talk to God. Do I move here? Let's talk to God. Do I change churches? Let's talk to God. What if, what if God got the ultimate say-so? And then where he gave us freedom which he does often, what if the next thing was, where are the people I want to do life with for the long haul? Because it, to be all that God created us to be requires those deep connections, and they take a lot of time, a lot of trust. And every time we move, right, we, we know this, every time, every time we move, we're starting over. We're start, and eventually, you just kind of get tired of it. And you wake up down the road, and you're like, well, we've got no one. I'm not going to tell you what you, is, what you have to do. That's the Lord. But I do believe that, that the culture we live in encourages us to just go chase whatever. And historically and biblically, it was more, more often to set roots and to grow deeply with people and to really impact the society rather than to just scatter about. The last thing is vulnerability and walking in the light. The time we spend with each other, we've got to choose and just, we've we got to go for it. We've got to be vulnerable and honest with each other. First John 1, 5 through 7 says this. You know, I'm just going to read from here. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Right? If we're going to have that deep connection with, with people, we, we've got to take the step and just be honest and vulnerable. If we're holding part of us back, right? Hiding, hiding didn't enter the picture until Genesis 3. H hiding is sin stuff. If there's anything that you're like, I have to hide this, that should be a red flag. Tells you something is, hey, hey don't go there, or you got to work through this. Hiding is not of the Lord. If we're going to have those deep friendships and connections with people, at some point we've got to pull back the curtain and say, hey, here's all of me, and let's see if we're going to do this. Right? We've we got to take that risk. And here's my experience. Most people are so grateful that you did so 
Because they're wanting someone to go, okay, here's all of my stuff too. Because none of us have it all figured out. All of us have, have parts we love for no one to know. And so when we can sit across from someone and go, oh, this is a safe place to do that. The depth of friendship that builds in that, that's when you can start walking in real fellowship. But we got to be willing to take that risk and trust. And you don't do that immediately, right? You, you got to know some people. But at some point, we got to walk in the light and we got to pull back the curtain and say, hey, here's, here's all of me. I was thinking about this yesterday. I don't know what made me think about it. Um, maybe it was a pastor that, you know, got disqualified for sin or whatever. And I was like, man, like, sin comes for all of us. All of us. And, and, and for all of us, I'm willing to bet there comes a point when you kind of look up and you go, oh, shoot, never saw that one coming. I would have never said that this would be me or this would be my thoughts or, 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 or whatever. I think we're far more sinful than we like to ever think or imagine. And I was like, man, what's actually going to keep us from giving into that temptation? How are we, we going to not give in? And, and I really believe the connection with Jesus and then full transparency with someone else is the only way. I, I just think if there's something, stuff that we're trying to deal with on our own, it's not just going to go away. We're going to put it under the rug and then it's going to mold and mildew and stink and permeate the whole house. At some point, if we really want to thrive and we want to walk in holiness, we have to let someone else into our life in every corner, in every aspect. Because we're just not going to win the battle on our own. If we want to have those connections, we have to spend time with people. And we've got to be honest and vulnerable in those relationships. What if there's no one here, no one around you? Or what, what, if, what if you're like, I, I would love it, but I don't, there's no one. Pray and ask. And then I'll go back to where we started. Be the friend to others that you hope they'll be to you. I believe Jesus will be the friend that you need and that I, he will provide for you. I, I, think there's, I think we'll supr be surprised with who God's put around us. Pray and ask and commit to be the friend to others that you hope that they will be to you. What if you have your people? There's some of you, I mean, I got my people. Like I'm, I got like my people. I'm good. My encouragement would be to celebrate that, flourish it, water it, invest in it for the long haul. Right? Walk deeply with them. But also don't close yourself off to others. You know who had the best relationship, didn't need other people, and yet opened himself up to others? That, that would be God who in his perfect eternal triune state did not need any other fellowship or community, had all the community he needed, and yet opened himself up in generous love to welcome others in. You and I are the recipients of perfect community, not closing themselves off. God not closing himself off to us, but being open to welcome us in. Would we trust God in the same way with our friendships and relationships? Water and nourish those people, those relationships. Hold on tightly to them, invest in them, build with them, walk with them, but don't close yourself off. Again, treat others how you would want them to treat you. If you're on the outside looking into those beautiful relationships, what do you want? You want them to pull up a chair, open up the door and pull up a chair for you, right? You want to be a part of that. We have to be mindful and open to that. Don't close yourself off. Where do we go from here? Community groups. If you're not in a community group, right, that's a great place to start. They're not going to be perfect. You're not going to walk in there and be like, oh my gosh, like fireworks just erupted and everything came together perfectly. It's going to take work. But so will any other relationship that you want to have for any length of time, right? Go and commit to one. Be a part of one. If there's one, you're like, I my schedule doesn't work. Hey, talk to me. Let's start a new one. I really think we probably need to start about two or three new ones, right? So let's be in a community group, discipleship groups. Katie, do you have that Ephesians book? I saw you with it earlier. No? Yeah, that, that Katie. Okay. In, in the top right corner there, there's like a greenish colored thing. 
um, is, a, is a, a journal to go through the book of Ephesians. It's meant to do, there it is, with two or three people in a discipleship group. If you're like, I don't have a discipleship group. I want one. What do I do? Grab one of those and go and ask somebody, hey, do you want to go through this with me? Right? Do you want to go through this with me? Let's do this together. Build, build into that. Be- become a member of this church. We just had a member interest meeting. I love that, those conversations. Become a, a, a part of the family. Right? Why, why be a member? Right? It, if you're a Christian, you're a part of the family. Um, I, I'm going to baseball. Sorry, everybody, if you're not a sports person. Right? If, if I'm going to go play baseball, but I'm like, I'm not a part of a team. I just float from team to team to team to team. A, what team is going to be like, hey, come on in. Right? It's cool. No. B, I'm not going to go anywhere. Right? We've got to commit to a family and be like, hey, I'm with you, you're with me, let's help each other, let's go. I'm not going anywhere, let's do this. Right? Be a part of this church. If it's not this church, okay. Be a part of another church in the area, it's non-negotiable, that will point you to Jesus, help you become more like him, and help you be all that God created you to be. We've got to take some steps. We cannot just sit back and be like, oh, we're missing stuff, and just wait for someone else to like, show up in your door and then someone will complain about that like oh you're soliciting i don't know there's always reasons that people are like stop it you know just come on step out there let's go take a step we cannot settle for nice acquaintances y'all it's not how we're made it's not how we're designed we've got to lean into each other and to commit to one another and what a beautiful picture of the gospel right that that jesus who had perfect community opened up his life, pulled up a seat at his table for you and for me, and invited us in to deep connection. Now let's remember when Jesus invited us in. Romans 5, 8. While we were still sinning, while you and I were actively giving him the middle finger and going the other way in hostility and sin towards him, in love he was pursuing us with a seat at his table for us wooing us with his kindness to turn and to go, oh, this is what I've been running from. And to trust him and to sit down with him. And when we have friendships like that, say, hey, I'm I'm running after you. I'm not going anywhere. It's going to get messy. And you know who's going to still be there? Me. Let's go. What a picture of Jesus' love. What an image of the reflection of God. It's for our own good for his glory, that we're invited into these deep connections. So, would you commit to it? Would you lay on the table before God, hey, what do you want for our lives? And if he gives you the freedom, I just want to encourage you at some point, set roots for the long haul. Because you need it, and so do the people around you. We need each other to be all that God created us to be. All right, let's pray.